Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Thanks everyone for having me. It's always great to be here. Today, I'm really here to talk about the new HIV guideline updates and focus on antiretroviral therapy and co-infection, I should say, related updates. We'll have a later talk from Dr. Dana Reddy about the updates in the OI guidelines. I have no disclosures, and here's our usual disclaimer. So today, our objectives are to really review these recent updates and the guidelines for use of antiretroviral agents in adults and adolescents with HIV. And the three areas I'm going to focus on are what to start, virologic failure, and then co-infections to review a couple of pertinent updates in latent tuberculosis or LTBI and in hepatitis B. This is not comprehensive, but I think the most relevant takeaways. So first, we'll start with what to start. Initial combination antiretroviral regimens for people with HIV. And how I'll frame this talk is taking, you know, a big takeaway and then try to go into some data or reasoning for why these decisions were made. So the first thing that happened is that I think many of us were anticipating this, but a back of your lamivudine dolutegravir or Triamec has been moved off the recommended initial regimens for most people with HIV and moved over to other initial antiretroviral regimens for cl certain clinical scenarios. So why is that? I think many of us have run into this clinically, right? It's hard to start it up front. We need HLA B5701 testing to ensure there's no at risk of hypersensitivity reaction. We've seen increasing data most recently at IAS from the reprieve cohort, but we've known this from prior cohorts, that there's a potential increase in the risk of cardiovascular events in people who have not just been currently on a back of your based regimens, but even previously been on them. And because, frankly, now we just have other options for initial therapy. So that's the big thing that came off the list. And then what came off even the other considerations list? So that's anything with elvitegravir and cobacistat as the anchor, anything with raltegravir as an anchor, boosted adazanavir-based regimens, efavirenz-based regimens, and then the real pivoting with TDF-FTC combination. So why are these moved off? Higher pill burdens. More adverse events that we've seen, including drug-drug interactions with our boosted regimens, and because we know these are lower barrier to resistance regimens. So I think out of these, no big surprises. So I think the big takeaway is now this table that Brian and others have used before and demonstrated for us. The what to start recommended initial regimens for most people with HIV, this table has gotten even shorter. So it should really be a second-generation integrase inhibitor with two NRTIs. And so we see BICTAF FTC or BICTARV, we see dolutegravir in combination with TAF FTC or dolutegravir in combination with TDF FTC or TDF uh, 3TC. And then we have the caveat of Devado. So the, the one, two drug regimen and the what to start regimen, the integrase plus one NRTI, dolutegravir or lamivudine, which again makes it to this list with the caveats of you need your viral load to be under 500,000. We need to know hep B status and specifically that our patient doesn't have hepatitis B and we need genotype information. So one could, and I will argue, I'm not certain that this should really be in the same table, DTG3TC, as the top three, but it is. And I think as long as we remember those caveats, we can think about these as our recommended initial start regimens. So that is the big move. And you'll Many of you know that the IAS had already made this recommendation to take Triamec off our start regimens um, a couple of years ago now, maybe December 2022, or maybe it was last year that they did that. So um, it makes sense that the HHS guidelines would follow. One question that I'll ask people to ruminate on that um, I've talked to some other people on this call about is, when would we use Triamec? You know, you'll notice that it was taken off the recommended initial start regimens for most people and moved into something that you might think about in other clinical scenarios. I myself am hard pressed to think about other clinical scenarios in an era where we have other regimens, like the two drug regimens of dolutegravir or lamivudine, but I'm always willing to hear other thoughts about when we could use that. Okay, with that, I'll pivot to virologic failure. 
And here I want to highlight two big takeaways that came out of the guideline update for me. So first, salvage regimens after failure on a 2-NRTI plus NNRTI anchored regimen now include dolutegravir and boosted darunavir, and this is an A1 recommendation. So just for us all to recall, other options previously listed and still listed for the scenario of failure on an NNRTI anchor still include second-generation integrase inhibitors like bictegravir or dolutegravir plus 2-NRTIs or a boosted protease inhibitor plus 2-NRTIs. So what led to this recommendation? So some of you may recall discussions of the D2-EFT study, and that looked at evaluation of three second-line antiretroviral strategies in people with HIV failing and an RTI-anchored therapy. The standard of care regimen was boosted darunavir with two NRTIs, and that was compared to dolutegravir plus boosted darunavir or dolutegravir plus TDF with either lamivudine or emtricitabine. And what were the takeaways? You can see here um, the plot from the paper that was uh, published this year in The Lancet. The big takeaway is that either switch was non-inferior, right? So compared to the standard of care regimen, but darunavir boosted plus dolutegravir actually demonstrated statistical superiority. And so as a result, it is in the guidelines now as a possible salvage regimen. Moving on to the next topic in virologic failure, long-acting cabotegravir or ropivirine. You know, we've had a lot of discussions about this in various um, settings in ECHO and in other lectures, but long-acting cabotegravir or ropivirine may be used on a case-by-case -case basis in select individuals with persistent virologic failure despite intensive adherence support on oral antiretroviral therapy with no resistance to either agent and with shared decision-making. You'll notice this is both a very wordy recommendation and a C3 recommendation. I think that's because we're still in an area of active exploration with this uh, strategy. And the guidelines, I really liked how they laid this out in the discussion. They talked about two different approaches to think about long-acting cabotegravir or pivirine. Approach one is to have intensive efforts to achieve viral suppression prior to a switch to the long-acting cabinuva or cabotegravir or pivirine. And approach number two is to consider administration of the long-acting cabrolpivirine in people who are still viremic but are unable to achieve viral suppression despite all of our best efforts and intensive adherence support. So let's go through the data on each of these approaches. So approach one, this was intensive efforts to achieve viral suppression prior to a switch to long-acting cabotegravir rolpivirine. And why is this an approach? Well, we know that the long-acting cabotegravir rolpivirine study has really enrolled participants and dealt with participants who were virally suppressed prior to the switch. So that's where our clinical trial data is. And then, many of you will remember and think about LATITUDE, this randomized clinical trial that looked at the long-acting ART strategy in people with adherence challenges, because that's frequently who we're most interested in using the strategy for. Participants were offered adherence support and economic incentives to achieve viral suppression on oral antiretrovirals prior to switch. And once they were suppressed, they were randomized to either oral continuation or monthly long-acting cabotegravir pivirine. And I, I'm telling you, based on the results, the Data Safety Monitoring Board recommended halting randomization and offering all participants long-acting cabotegravir pivirine. And what were those results? So this slide is still from the uh, CROI presentation. And what you can see is at week 48, 24% in the long-acting arm and 39% in the standard of care arm meant the primary endpoint of earliest confirmed virologic failure or treatment discontinuation. And I want to point out, as it's been pointed out prior, that this did not meet the stopping criteria for the trial, but it was two of the three secondary endpoints that I have um, here, virologic failure alone, and treatment-related failure, which was defined as the first virologic failure or discontinuation due to adverse events that met the predefined stopping criteria and were statistically significant. So you can see in virologic failure, only 7.2% of the long-acting arm as compared to 25% of the standard of care arm, and then about 10 versus 26% in treatment-related failure. So we know that this can be a successful strategy for people who are struggling with oral ART but have managed to suppress before their transition. But what about people who can't achieve viral suppression? Can we still administer long-acting cabotegravir or in these individuals? 
And why are we asking this? And it's simply because, and this is not the wording of the guideline, this is my wording, it's the people who can't suppress on orals need another option, right? It hasn't been working what we have for them. We have to find something else. And so, again, others have reviewed these studies in more detail. It's primarily observational. And so we have some observational and compassionate use data that suggests that select people with viremia and poor oral adherence can suppress on cabotegravir real pivirine. And I've cited three recent papers that look at this. And I think people remember the paper out of UCSF. There have been a couple subsequently. But what we really need to recognize is the risk of virologic failure on cab real pivirine is associated with a real risk of new and significant reverse transcriptase and integrase resistance assay mutations. And that those have been documented in these papers. They do happen. And so what do the guidelines suggest that we do? They really say if you're going to pursue the strategy, monitor closely. We might prefer doing the monthly dosing strategy of cabotegravir real pivirine, as was done in latitude, versus the Q2 monthly dosing, just so we have closer monitoring. And think about novel adherence strategies, as has been, have been utilized in, for example, the UCSF setting. So that was really my discussion explicitly about antiretrovirals. And I slid in co-infections because it is in this section of the guideline update as opposed to co-infections. So the first one that I thought was interesting was looking at latent tuberculosis treatment in people with HIV. So for people with HIV who are virally suppressed on a daily dolutegravir-based regimen, so they can't be on BID dolutegravir to begin with, the strategy of 1-HP, or once daily isoniazid plus rifapentine, for a month is an acceptable regimen for latent tuberculosis treatment, as long as the dolutegravir dosage is increased to twice daily. And I'll note that this should be continued twice daily dosing for 14 days after completion of that one month 1-HP course. So what's our background on why we think this strategy works? So back in 2019, we knew that 1-HP was non-inferior to nine months of isoniazid in the brief TB study. But we couldn't extrapolate to our integrase anchors because the anchor drug was primarily efavirenz and some nevirapine. And we already know that dolutegravir trough concentrations can be dramatically reduced by rifamycins. Um, in some studies, 50 to 60% with weekly rifapentine. Although I'll note this caveat that some people will say that you know, even with that dose reduction for people who are already virally suppressed, viral suppression was largely maintained in studies of once daily dosing. It's kind of a side note. Now we've had in the last year a pharmacokinetic study in people with HIV on daily dolutegravir as their baseline ART regimen who then had their dose increased to BID while on 1-HP and for 14 days thereafter. And what they were able to find is that trough concentrations were comparable to daily dosing dolutegravir in someone without latent TB and being treated for latent TB, and 97% remained virologically suppressed. So thus, this is now in our guidelines as a possible um, treatment regimen. And our last co-infection is a brief note about hepatitis B. And so they have this update that people with HIV and chronic hepatitis B should be tested for hepatitis D virus with a serologic test, with the antibody test, followed by hep D RNA if positive. And why um, are we doing this? This is from survey data that some people actually who are often speakers on this call have been involved in. It was a survey of people with HIV and hep B co-infection in the United States and those individuals in that survey, there were 4% who were hep D antibody positive. Of those who were hep D antibody positive, almost 42% had detectable RNA. And this really begs the question, what, why do we care about this? What, what is the point of this? In the context of co-infection of hep B and HIV, triple infection with hep D as well has been associated with worse clinical outcomes, including high rates of liver-related death, liver decompensation, and hepatocellular carcinoma. And what we don't have right now is a reliable treatment for hepatitis D virus that we're using widely. There is definitely research on this. There have been presentations on new drugs under investigation. But I think the point for now, at least, is that earlier screening may lead to closer monitoring for liver complications. The guidelines also suggest that an expert a virologist or hepatologist should be involved in care of these people who are triple infected. And as novel hep D therapies do arise, this may become data of utility for patient care. That being said, I've, I've kind of gone through my big updates and takeaways. 
I do encourage people to look at some new sections that are in these guideline updates. There's a new section on transplantation in people with HIV, which, which is new for the first time. Some basic guidance. Their big recommendation is have a multidisciplinary team involved in care. There's some updates in the HIV and the older person section. There's substance use disorders and HIV updates, transgender people with HIV updates, and then optimizing antiretroviral therapy in the setting of viral suppression. This was mostly discussion of switch strategies and more clinical trial data on these switch strategies, for example, in long-acting cabotegravir pivirine and people with extensive drug resistance. And I do want to make a theme across all these updates. The point that they've made is ensure that you have hepatitis B active drugs for those who are hep B and HIV co-infection in the true drug era. So this becomes a big point in all of these switch strategies, especially as we think about our long-acting injectables. So take-home points. A Bacavir-based Triamec is no longer a first-choice regimen for ART initiation. Dolutegravir plus boosted darunavir is now added to the potential regimens to use in the setting of virologic failure on an NNRTI-anchored regimen. Long-acting cabotegravir pivirine should be considered for people struggling with oral therapy adherence with shared decision-making. 1-HP, or month, only one month of daily isoniazid and rifapentine for LTBI, is an acceptable regimen for people with HIV whose current regimen is just daily dolutegravir-based. And we should be screening for hepatitis D in those with HIV and hep B co-infection. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.